Christian Parent Crazy World with Catherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you raise godly kids in an ungodly world. I'm your host, Katherine Seegers, and today's episode tackles this critical question. What sets the Christian worldview apart from other worldviews? Now, I know, I know, I've done two episodes on worldview already, but there is so much meat on the bone here, people. So much to learn and share. You know, you know how when you rent or or purchase a movie, sometimes you have this this bonus material like deleted scenes or supplementary videos that further explain the film. I love that stuff. I eat it up. I have to watch every single one of those scenes. So think of this episode and the next episode as bonus material on worldviews. Yes, I've got two more episodes that I want to do on this topic before we move on. Honestly, this stuff is better than the movie. It is the most enlightening and transformative information I have shared with you on this topic thus far. Truly, it is. These two episodes will give you a vital, clarifying, overarching global perspective on worldviews. It's going to help you when discussing worldviews with your kids or your friends or when you're getting in arguments on Facebook. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't do that. For the most part, those are really pointless. Or, you know, just thinking about worldviews yourself in in your spare time when you're just sitting around contemplating the meaning of life because us parents have so much time to do that, right? Mm. That's why you're here, right? We can do this together. So here's how these two episodes are going to break down. The first bonus scene in this episode will help you understand worldviews and how Christianity is distinctive among worldviews, what sets it apart. And we will start to chip away at the philosophical underpinnings of some of the other worldviews that don't really have a stable foundation. Then, and the second bonus scene in the next episode, we will defend the Christian worldview by showing how the Christian worldview defends humanity, how it creates the world we all want to live in. That episode, Mamas and Papas, is the piece de resistance. It is the culmination of all the hard work we have done to understand worldviews. That episode is where we finally become convinced of why the Christian worldview is not only the best explanation of reality, but why the Christian worldview creates the reality we all want to live in. And when we and our kids can understand that, watch out, because we're going to have a really strong faith. So let's get started. First, I want to make a clarification that is a bit of a (laughs) confession. Uh, This was completely inadvertent. I did a lot of research for that last episode where I covered seven different primary worldviews. And in that research, I heard a question, well, I heard a lot of stuff, but I heard a question from an author slash podcaster slash blogger that truly encapsulates the critical information we need to know when we consider the issue of worldviews. That question is, which worldview best represents and explains reality. I repeated that question a few times in the last episode, and I alluded to it here in this one. And at the time when I heard this question, I, I, I really thought that this was just like a general question circulating around out there from multiple sources. I didn't think it was this person's own invention. But I've since done some more research, and I was like, I haven't seen this question anywhere else, so I'm thinking that it was this person's own invention, and I should have credited her with that amazing, clarifying question in the last episode. By the way, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. So anyways, uh, the author, podcaster, blogger who came up with that question is a woman named Natasha Crane. To say that I am a huge fan of Natasha Crane would be an understatement. I have followed her work for years and I've been so blessed 
by her profound intellect and her gracious spirit. Her ability to boil down an issue to the most critical points is truly, truly remarkable and inspiring. So I heard that question in one of Natasha's podcasts, and I want to give her full credit for boiling down the issue of worldview so perfectly. Natasha has a knack of doing that. Truly, she is exceptionally gifted. And I encourage you to check out her website, which I'm going to link in the notes section. I wanted to make that clear first because the first bonus scene that we have here that we're covering in this episode is from Natasha as well. You know, sometimes you hear something and you think, well, I've had that thought before, but this person verbalized this issue or question so perfectly. That is the case with Natasha's question, which worldview best represents or explains reality? But then sometimes you hear something that you've never heard before, and suddenly you never think of that topic or issue the same way again. That idea revolutionizes your understanding and transforms your thinking. That is is the case with this first bonus scene from Natasha Crane on world views. Bonus scene number one has to do with how to classify world views. So when looking at the, the massive landscape of world views, Natasha points out that we are tempted to put someone's worldview in one of two categories. We're, we're tempted to ask this question. Is their worldview religious or non-religious? That totally makes sense because those would seem to be the two overarching categories, right? Let's let's think back on what we learned in the last episode. Quick review. You have the religious worldviews like theism or monotheism that encompassed uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam primarily. Uh, Then there was pantheism. That was the Star Wars like force type religions where you've got Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and New Age consciousness. Then there was spiritism or polytheism, that encompassed religions like Taoism, Japanese Shinto, traditional African religions. Then there was pluralism, which is kind of a best of album where you get to pick and choose your favorite aspects of each religion. And finally, there was moralistic therapeutic deism, the mouthful. That is the God just wants me to be happy theology. Again, I went over all of those worldviews in the last episode, by the way, so you should just check that out if you haven't already. Then come back to this one because it's about to get really good. Uh, And then we have the non-religious worldviews. That was naturalism, which houses the beliefs of atheism, agnosticism, existentialism, and scientism. And finally, you have postmodernism, which doesn't house another belief system. It is an ever-evolving system all in itself. So the religious-non-religious divide is a very logical way to define and categorize worldviews. That is what I would do. But it is not the most helpful way to look at worldviews. Natasha suggests that instead of asking, is this worldview religious or non-religious, we should ask this question. It's so great. Uh, From where does this worldview get its authority? I love this question because every worldview claims something or someone as its source of authority. Let's break that down. Let's look at the theistic worldviews again. So in the Christian worldview, we look to God or Yahweh and Jesus as our authority and the Bible as the written revelation of that authority. In the Jewish worldview, uh, they look to God or Yahweh as its authority as well. And with the Old Testament being the written revelation of that authority, they have some other holy books as well, but primarily the Old Testament. Islam looks to Allah and Muhammad as its authority, with the Quran and other holy books being the written revelation of that authority. Now, beyond the theistic worldviews, the source of authority is a little bit harder to find. It's it's kind of like that carnival game you play where you try to find where the marble is under three rotating coconut shells. You think you know where it is, but really it's somewhere else. I'll explain that more in a sec. But first, let's determine what is the higher authority with the non-religious worldviews. We're tempted to think that there isn't one. 
But that would be wrong. There is. Everyone claims some source as the authority for their worldview. Naturalists and postmodernists still have a source of authority, even though they do not believe in God, either, either not at all or at least not in an authoritative sense. The source of authority for the naturalistic and postmodern worldview is, drumroll please, drrr, themselves. Make no mistake about it. They do claim a source of authority for their beliefs, but that source is not above them. It is is them. They get to determine right and wrong for themselves and for society. Are you seeing flashbacks of a little scene in the Garden of Eden from the Christian worldview where the serpent said, you will be like God? Hmm. Yeah, I am. Now, really, beyond theism or monotheism, the higher authority is very hard to define because it, it isn't really what it appears to be, thus the carnival game analogy. Let's look at the other worldviews. The higher authority for pantheism with its nebulous and personal higher spirit force a la Star Wars, and the higher authority for polytheism with many gods and a shaman figure telling us what has irritated those higher beings, and the authority for pluralism, where you get to pick your favorite higher authority from a plethora of gods and energies, and the authority for moralistic therapeutic deism, where you get to use God as a therapy to get you through the tough times in life, but it doesn't really require anything from you or care what you do, with each and every one of these other religious worldviews beyond theism, the authority isn't a higher source at all. It is either another human, as is the case with polytheism and cults, or it is oneself, just like the non-religious worldviews. Yeah, it's kind of a trick question there, isn't it? What is the authority for your worldview? When it comes to other religious worldviews beyond theism, that question is like trying to figure out which coconut shell has the marble. It looks like it's over here, but nope, nope, nope. Really, it's over there. In most instances beyond theism, the authority for your worldview is another human being or yourself, just like the non-religious worldviews. And you know what? If there isn't a God, then we must come up with a human source for our definition of right and wrong, what is and what isn't socially acceptable behavior. And self is the right source of authority if there isn't a God. That's the right answer. And why not go with what the majority of people think? Or find someone who is a lot smarter than you and make them your authority. But if there is a God, then cutting the creator out of the picture would truly be like cutting off your nose Despite your face, you will only hurt yourself by ignoring what he has to say about right and wrong, good and evil. So, the defining question about worldviews isn't whether your worldview is religious or non-religious, but rather, as our brilliant friend Natasha Crane suggests, from where does your worldview get its authority? Every worldview has one, but is their source of authority legitimate? And does that source of authority have a history of producing good results, just results? I think that the Christian worldview's authority has the right to be an authority because he is God. He is above us. We aren't equals. And as God, he has the knowledge, the, the power, the expertise, and the credibility to define reality because he created Reality, And I think that leaders who have properly used the Christian theistic source as, as their authority in governing have an incredible track record of producing just results. We're going to talk about that more in the next episode. But, but what if there isn't a God? Is there any benefit in believing in one anyways? I, I want to explore that question a little bit because I find this fascinating. But first, here is the ultimate question. If the authority in your worldview is yourself, then why is your moral standard any better than mine? Or, or Mao's or Stalin's or Lenin's or Hitler's? Hmm? 
Yeah, (laughs) that is a good question that we need to explore. And to do so, I'd like to leave you with some parting thoughts on the misuse of power historically. So hopefully you can see the problems we face as a society when each individual claims themselves or, or another human being as a source for their authority in their worldview. Who's right? Do, do we just bow to the worldview of the majority? What if the majority supports something inhumane, like sex trafficking or, or racism or slavery or genocide? That has happened many times throughout history. It is happening now in some parts of the world, per, perhaps even ours. With the wrong worldview, we can quickly devolve into a society ruled by the concept of might makes right. That has been the MO of of humankind throughout human history, hasn't it? Where society has broken free from that type of totalitarianism is when we recognize an authority beyond ourselves, an authority that promotes human dignity and a standard of right and wrong. You know, as I was I was contemplating this topic, I remembered a debate I went to many years ago. It was in grad school, uh, and it was a debate between Alan Dershowitz and Alan Keyes. It was on the role of religion in society. I never forgot it. It was incredible. I actually found a video of that debate online. <laughs> Funny. The internet didn't even exist when they did this debate, and now it's on the internet. Technology is just amazing. So I'm going to post the debate in the link section. It's from a different college than the one I went to, university. But it was the same debate I went to. And you'll notice that the year was 2000. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was in grad school in 2000. Actually, (laughs) I started grad school in 93 and took the scenic route. I'm an old mama with some young kids. What can I say? You know, God works in mysterious ways. So just for some context, Alan Dershowitz is a Harvard Law School professor and political commentator. You may be familiar with him. And Alan Keyes was a presidential candidate and former UN ambassador during the Reagan administration. It was a battle of the Allens, and it was epic. It was fascinating. It's still so relevant. And, you know, obviously, it's been a couple of decades, but I still remember an argument that Dr. Keyes made, which was so profound. It was about why we as a society need a higher authority. Um, So many have suggested that our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. So if that's true, he would have come from the naturalist worldview. To this claim, Keyes suggests, you know, he says, well, he sure tolerated the mention of God's name a lot for a guy who didn't believe in him. Touche, Dr. Keyes. He was so great. Uh, But he goes on to say that if Jefferson didn't believe in God, that is a stronger case than anything for why we need to look at our Declaration of Independence, which was written from a theistic perspective as it clearly claims the existence of a creator. Why is that claim there? The document says we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Either one... Jefferson and the other crafters of our founding documents believed it. They were theists, and their theistic worldview led them to create the most prosperous and free nation the world has ever known. Or two, they didn't believe it, and they still recognized our need for a higher authority than ourselves. Yep, those are the only two options. And yes, I do know that the United States wasn't a free place for everyone at its inception. It wasn't free for blacks and it wasn't free for women. But where in the world was it free for blacks and women at that time? Some people today, I would suggest people with an agenda, act like the problems of slavery and oppression of women were unique to the U.S. or, or the West. They weren't. This problem was worldwide. Yes, the Atlantic slave trade was happening throughout the West, and it was, it was far worse in Central and South America. It was happening throughout Europe and Great Britain. But let's not forget, African men, women, and children were sold into slavery by their own 
countrymen, by African kings and, and rulers, by merchants, by competing tribes. We, we don't teach this anymore in our textbooks. Fierce tribalism around Africa contributed to the slave trade. If they had been united, the slave trade couldn't have happened, not like it did. The European slave traders didn't just stop at a port and start kidnapping people. The slaves were sold by African rulers and merchants, often from competing tribes like like the Ashanti, who did the kidnapping and the selling. The slave traders did the buying and then the selling. Which is worse? I don't know. You tell me, I I think they are both vile. And before the European slave trade from Africa, there was the Arab Muslim slave trade from Africa. It's a taboo subject now, but some historical accounts show that as many, if not more, African slaves died being transported across the Sahara to the Middle East than in the European slave trade. Again, both are vile. But slavery of oppressed people groups has been happening throughout all of human history. It is happening right now in China with the Uyghurs. Have you seen the pictures? They're heartbreaking. Slavery isn't just an American problem or or a European problem or a British problem or a Middle Eastern or Far Eastern problem or even an African problem. It is a human problem that has existed since the dawn of time. I believe we need a divine solution, not another human one, because the human remedies aren't working. And and where were women free in the world at that time? Uh, nowhere. What the founders of the United States created was a system of government that eventually led to the freedom of the slaves and of women because it enshrined rights to the individual endowed by whom? Not not by fellow humans, which every other worldview does. That is not where the authority lied. Those rights came from our creator, from a theistic worldview. Such an idea had never been instituted before in government. The closest thing they came to was the Magna Carta, and that stopped well short of most men And all women. And it was godly men and women like like William Wilberforce and, and a repentant and redeemed John Newton and Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. Men and women with a Christian worldview led the charge to end the slave trade. I'm going to talk about that more in the next episode. And godly women birthed the women's liberation movement. Our forefathers created a governmental foundation that enshrined the rights of equality and freedom before they fully upheld those principles, yes. But these rights were bestowed not by man, but by God, so that no man could take them away. And they created a system that could and would correct itself for the very first time time. With that in mind, I want to read you part of this debate because Dr. Key's argument is so enlightening. There wasn't a transcript, by the way, so so I made one myself. That's how much I care. So Key said in that debate, I encourage you to listen to it yourself because I can't really do Dr. Key's justice. He is he is an incredible expositor. One time I, I went to a lecture of his and he went on for an hour without a single note. Blew all of us away. Incredible. So Dr. Key said, if Jefferson didn't acquiesce in the reference to the creator because he thought it was true, maybe he did it because he thought it was necessary necessary for what? Necessary in order to complete the argument that constrains human power. Necessary in order to establish a ground so that the weak and the defenseless, so those with no power, those with no eloquence, those with no case to be made by their money or status or anything else about them that would be able to stand in the face of every human 
power whatsoever and demand respect for their human rights and dignity. Hmm. Good stuff. I'm going to skip around a little bit here and paraphrase some sections. Do we think that this constraint of human power comes about because another individual just feels like bestowing those human rights upon us today? No, it doesn't. We need a higher power, a higher source of authority to constrain us. Dr. Keyes says, how do we get the folks who would otherwise be, be tempted to abuse their superiority to listen? And how do we get those who would otherwise be tempted to simply submit to their abuse to have the courage to oppose them? That is a great question. History is littered with those who have abused their power and those who have let them. How do we stop that cycle of abuse? Keys offers this answer. I want to read a little bit more of this speech to you that I transcribed for you lovingly. Dr. Key says, our founders were faced with a real problem and they wanted a solution that had some chance of being translated into a relatively lasting reality. And they understood one principle, a little bit cynical perhaps, but nonetheless verified by much of human history, that power ultimately only respects a greater power. Isn't that sad? Power cannot be relied upon to respect a greater wisdom. It, it cannot be relied upon to respect greater holiness. Power doesn't necessarily respect us. How can you come up with something a little more reliable than that? I think the aim of the founders was at, at least to invoke a paradigm that offered a sure foundation for our appeals to conscience what better logic to face power with than the notion that whatever power you have, I gain my dignity from the absolute greatest power of all, the one you cannot touch, the one you cannot equal, the one before whom every human being pales by comparison. And because I claim my dignity by virtue of that greater power, even on the day you defeat me, even on the day you put your foot on my neck and trample me into the dust, I still live in the hope that my justice will rise because you cannot defeat his will. I tried to do him justice there. Man, it was so good. You got to listen to it. He's amazing. I told you it was profound, right? So finally, I'm going to wrap this up. I promise. Finally, Dr. Keyes says, we forget, don't we? When, when we talk about the civil rights movement and all these things you think it was an accident that Martin Luther King was a preacher? Because I know it was not. If we mean to have the courage to defend our liberty, then I believe we must preserve our reliance upon that appeal which lies beyond the reach of human power and which therefore cannot be defeated in hope even when it is defeated in battle. Booyah! Dr. Keyes is making the argument that we need an authority higher than ourselves, if we want to live in a just society that preserves human rights and human dignity. He is making the argument that the theistic worldview is necessary because otherwise a worldview that bases its authority in oneself or another self will not accomplish justice or freedom. History tells the tale. Those worldviews produce a society where might makes right. Those worldviews have not accomplished justice or freedom. They have not preserved human dignity. Dr. Keyes made a powerful argument that as a society, we need God because we need an authoritative source beyond ourselves to help us govern ourselves. <sighs> we are swimming in some deep waters now. I hope you're with me. Oh, this has been so awesome. I have loved digging up this information for you. And we're going to explore that conclusion more in the next episode when we answer this crucial question. How does the Christian worldview create the world we all want to live in? Oh, it's going to be so good. In that episode, we're going we're gonna to go into that second piece of bonus information that will help you and your kids defend the Christian worldview. This scene will help you understand where many of these other worldviews don't add up, where they start to fall apart because they don't accurately explain and represent reality or the outcomes we want in our reality. So in that episode, I'm going to wrap up this series on worldviews, I think. 
you know, well, I am a woman, so I may change my mind. I don't know. But truly, you do not want to miss that episode or any episode, really, but especially that one. It is the culmination of all we have learned in the past three episodes. It is the mic drop when it comes to worldviews. And a little teaser, I might even sing. What? Yeah, yeah, I might. You'll have to tune in to find out. (laughs) So I want to thank you for joining me today. I know there are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast where we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and and sharing it on social media and giving me a good rating? That would be so helpful. Oh, oh, and maybe you could cut the letters CPCW into your front lawn. That would be a great way to start a conversation with your neighbors and just just a thought. And be sure to check out my website, which is katherinesegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you Your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. To hear more from Catherine Seegers, visit her site, katherineseegers.com. If you enjoyed this episode, would you take a minute and leave us a rating and review in your podcast app? It really does help us connect to more listeners like you. A special thanks to Kelly Gibbons, Stephen Sanders, and Stephen McGarvey for their production and editing on this episode. You can find more podcasts like this over at lifeaudio.com.